Hey guys, King Gath here with Bethesda Mod School. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how to use the Workshop Framework Custom Vendor System to integrate custom shop types right into the base workshop system so they work exactly like the vanilla versions. It's very straightforward to do. There's quite a few steps, but uh, none of them are particularly difficult, especially if you're just going to slightly modify an existing one. Obviously, if you're going to bring in your own custom dialogue or your own custom models for the shop types, that makes it a little more complicated. But at that point, we have other tutorials to cover that sort of thing. So you guys can go to those. So this is just going to cover the actual implement implementation of the pieces that involve the workshop framework stuff and then I will point to the things that uh, I did kind of off camera. In fact, I did all of this off camera, but I'll point to the things that I'm not directly showing you that you can easily find out in other tutorials. Real simple things like making the construction records so that they're actually buildable workshop mode stuff. That's stuff you guys, if you follow my series, you've already seen how to do. And if not, there are plenty of links to get to those tutorials, so it shouldn't be too hard. Um, now I do want to say to my constant viewers, I, my apologies for my availability. is It is going to be sketchy for the uh, next few months because we are powering through uh, development of another Sims Elements expansion. And uh, we're in the, um, I want to say, I, I don't know what the timeline is, but we're in the final uh, phases of uh, getting it ready to get into like proper beta testing and whatnot. So a lot of my time is dedicated to that. And so these, these releases are going to be a little less frequent than I'd like, but uh, I will pop in here periodically and do this for you guys. So uh, let's go ahead and demonstrate this guy first. That's why we're in game. So I put this settler over here. Oh, and I should show you guys uh, when I talk to him, he just has normal settler dialogue. Hurts. Yeah, Feet thanks, hurt. buddy. Uh, and then Never we're going to go ahead and assign him to this shop. Now it looks just like a normal armor shop, but if you can see there, the name is combat item stand and if i go ahead and pop into my stores here under armor you'll see that uh, i have a whole series i've got the sand stand i've got the shop type and i've got the emporium over here so i've got them all configured uh, we're gonna go ahead and assign you okay. to the emporium our defense drops i'll wander his way over oh pardon me um, and we'll let him go ahead and do his animation so that you can see this works exactly like the vanilla shops and uh, hopefully that'll get you amped up to get in there and build your own versions of these because I think uh, these can be pretty cool and if you are a sim settlements add-on developer yes these will work with some settlements plots as well so let's go ahead hey and talk there. to him if you're looking for armor I may have something you and can he's use. got armor dialogue as I set him up to do let's see what We're you have and barter what I got and you can see I did a custom inventory. It's a mix of uh, part of the uh, armor vendor and part of the weapon vendor. So a little unbalanced in the shop types. Got a lot more inventory available. But from the perspective of uh, actual advantage to the settlement, it has the exact same numbers as an armor shop. So it's no different there. Same cost to build it. Same daily income that's brought in by it. So the only difference is that me as the player would get access to a little more inventory from something like this. But balance is a whole other thing. I'm not here to discuss that. You guys can deal with that as you like. But I just wanted to show you guys that those do indeed work. And then... I'll I'll go ahead and set up a level two shop and bop them over there. Oh, we'll go ahead and do a level three if it'll let me. No, I don't have enough caps. Um, okay, let's go to armor shop. Combat. Oh, where's that? Combat item shop. Did I not give myself enough caps? There it goes. Uh, oh, I guess I could do the Emporium. Nope. I don't know why it's not letting me do that. It's it's letting. It looks like it's going to let me do the, uh, the shop, though. Let's see. Combat item. Where are you? There it goes. Some of the uh, god mode stuff can be a little finicky in this. All right, let's go ahead and pop you over. There we go. And now his inventory should change in just a second. So let's give him a moment. Oh, hey, look at that. We've got a, I've got to flip his uh, animation marker around. I did not do that correctly. So I'll show you guys how to fix something like that if that happens as well when we <laughs> are popping Need in armor? there. I do. Let's see what let's you see got. Inventory. Let me know what you'd like. And, his, and now we've got quite a bit more things to choose from here. So, uh, all right, so I'm gonna show you guys in the CK now how you go ahead and configure this to work for yourselves. Okay, I am in the CK now. I've got our mod up and running so I can walk you through all the different things that I set up here. And then we're gonna talk about a couple of things that uh, you don't have to worry about setting up. So first we're gonna bring up a little script here and I will be including the source for this in the Bethesda Mod School kit. So this started out as the custom control request. So you guys do not have to worry about the scripting of this. I'm gonna include the script so you can use it as is. All you will have to do is change a couple of things. You're gonna to wanna to change, um, you're gonna to wanna to put it in some other folder, not inside KG templates, and then you're gonna come into the script and change this to the name of your folder. And then you're gonna go into the uh, creation kit here 
And uh, when you add the script to your thing, you're going to uh, comp you're going to need to recompile it. So you're basically going to uh, go into Gameplay and Papyrus Script Manager, search up your script, right click it, and hit compile. It's real it's real simple. If you're not sure how to do that, if you're uncomfortable with that, go check out the uh, scripting guides. The very first one should be very straightforward and uh, fine for any of you guys who have never done any scripting. But you're basically going to need to compile yourself your own version so that you are not overwriting anybody else who follows this tutorial and releases this. You don't want to have your script competing with theirs especially if they made edits then they might break your mod so you're gonna to want to make sure that you have your own and, uh, and if you don't want to do the namespace thing like putting which is just putting it in a folder basically instead you could just get rid of this first part from the colon change the name of this completely so change this whole line make sure your file name matches whatever it is that you type right here and uh, again compile it in the CK and you're good to use it so once you've got that script compiled we're gonna you're gonna start by creating yourself a new quest so you're gonna just right click in the quests so under character quests and uh, go ahead and give yourself uh, your quest an ID here. You're gonna set the priority to 30 and then hit okay. So I've already done that, so I'm gonna bring mine up. And then after you hit okay, you're gonna search it back up. So I've filtered for mine here and searched it back up. And that's because a whole bunch of new tabs will show up after you've done that. Now some of the, the tabs that we need are actually there initially, but it tends to be that things go a little bit crazy if you try and add a script before first hitting okay on your new quest. And uh, that basically allows it to create the record so that it can show all these screens. So I find it best to just go ahead and hit OK after you name it and give it the priority 30. And then probably save your plugin because uh, this CK is wonderfully crashy. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set up two stages. And uh, the script needs these stages. You, they're not really important for anything that you need to worry about. But it's just something that uh, some pattern that I follow in my scripts that requires this. So you're going to create stages one and two. You can uh, add these logs or not. It's not important. All that matters is that you have two stages name with index one and two. Uh, and if you can't recall how to do that, you basically right click and uh, hit new and then you enter in one. I'm not going to be able to because I already have the one. So I'm just going to enter 10. Um, do it again. Right click new and enter two. Again, I entered 20 because if I enter the same one, it's going to give me an error. But you just basically want to enter indexes one and two. That's all that's important for that step. Okay, so then that's the end of all of the rest of these tabs. The only thing, that we're, everything else we're going to be doing is on this this scripts tab. Um, so after you've compiled your script under Gameplay uh, Papyrus Script Manager, you're going to add it to this quest. So you can either drag and drop it from that Papyrus Script Manager, or click Add here and uh, search it up. And then once you've added it, it should bring up the screen right here. Um, so this screen, there's a couple of things on here. So this ESP version, you can skip this if you like. I like to use this because the that script that I did has a version control built in. And the idea is basically it will allow you to, in the future, if you do some updates to the mod that require script changes, you can, you'll be notified, your script will be notified that the version changed and so it will know to run certain things. So if you're not a coder, this is, has no use to you so you can just skip it. But if you are a coder and you want that control, you want to be able to react to your own version upgrades, basically you just create a global with the constant flag checked and give it a version number. Uh, I tend to use just integers and just increment each time and then I just track outside of the CK what version number I'm on for my releases and I just increment one each time and then every time I release, I'll just come in, tick this up to the next number and uh, hit OK, and then my script will be aware of it, and I can check for that number. But if you're not a coder, you can skip this field. Um, everybody should grab, click on this, and just hit the autofill button. That'll fill in player ref for you. Uh, same with workshop parent. Click on this, hit autofill. So that will leave you with just these four right here to fill in. And I'm going to tell you right now, two of them are actually optional. So keywords and factions are completely optional. Um, so that leaves you now with just two fields you need to fill in. But we're going to come back to those. So we're going to hit OK here after you've auto-filled Workshop Parent and Player Ref. And we're going to just hit OK and OK. And I'm going to show you how to set up the other stuff first. And then we'll come back because the other stuff you set up is what you're going to fill in those properties. So there are a couple of things to keep in mind with your vendor. So first up, you should be thinking about uh, what the type of items the vendor will sell, uh, what type of of the vanilla ones it looks closest to and seems closest to because you're gonna to have to choose one for dialogue. But fortunately there is a very generic set of dialogue that's uh, considered miscellaneous by Bethesda, it's labeled that way and that's the one the general shop does where they don't talk about any of their merchandise in particular. They just kind of say, uh, I'm sure I've got something you need, lines like that. That's, that is actually the default one that Workshop Framework will fall back to if you just don't fill in a dialogue faction. But if you have an idea, of one of them that you think your character would uh, fit well in the dialogue loop for and those lines would fit, then you can choose that. And to figure that out, you basically um, would uh, look at, well, first of all, you'd go in game and play with the vanilla ones and listen to the shopkeeper's lines and see which one feels right. And uh, then you're gonna end up choosing 
one of these down here. So if you go under character and faction and search up uh, workshop vendor or just vendor and go to the bottom near the workshop ones, you can see the ones you'll have to choose from. So the miscellaneous is the default one. You don't have to fill that in, but if you want to sound like any of these other guys, those are what you're going to end up using when we get to that step. So that's one thing you've got to do. You've got to pick that out. Uh, the next thing we've got to do is actually set up the inventory for our characters. And what I tend to do is I will take the default vendor chest, the workshop vendor chest, I will pick one that's similar to what I want and then I'll start tweaking it. Because there's a thing you gotta know about workshop vendor chests and that's that they're additive. So when you see those three different shop types in the base game, there's the level one, level two, level three effectively, They Bethesda has labeled them the shop, I'm sorry, the stand, the shop, and the emporium. And the way they work is there's a level one chest a level two chest and a level three chest and the level two shop, so the one that's called shop instead of stand, gets all of the inventory of the first one. The level three emporium gets all the inventory of the previous two as well. And then in addition, all of those are shared between every vendor of that type in that settlement. So Sanctuary will have one of these vendor chests to share. Red Rocket will have one of these vendor chests to share, etc. cetera. Um, and that's one of the advantages of using this vendor system versus just setting up your own custom hijack system. So if you've done any of the uh, scripting tutorials from some settlements regarding that or use some of the, the resources that we've released on our forums in regards to custom vendors, the way those worked is one universal vendor. The same if you followed any of the generic tutorials from Skyrim or Fallout 4 that showed you how to set up a vendor outside of settlements is again, you're generally setting up one set of vendor containers that uh, work for that uh, that assignment rather than one per settlement. So that's why this the customization within Workshop Framework is really powerful in that regard is you get to take advantage of that, each settlement having its own separate inventory. Um, so what I will do is I will tend to pick one of these and start with it. Now, one thing you'll notice is that I only went up to three, whereas Bethesda has gone up to four on all of theirs. And their number four is actually for something you might not even be aware of, but uh, in the Fallout 4's base game, there's a what people started calling a top tier or level four vendors of Available. And those are there are certain NPCs, there's one for each of the shop types, that if you find them out in the world and recruit them and assign them to a level 3 shop, they will have a little bit of extra inventory. And um, that's what those are for. The custom vendor shops do not support that, mostly because it would involve you guys setting up your own custom NPCs and everything. And then there are plenty of other ways to give them special inventory without needing this special system. And if you're the type of person who can set up a special NPC, a special vendor, you're also the type who can figure out other ways to inject special items into their barter inventory. So I felt it was unnecessary to go to that depth in the code that Workshop Framework includes. Okay, so once you've got a shop type that you're comfortable with kind of emulating, basically what you're going to do is you're going to take their containers and you're going to duplicate them. So I tend to just uh, grab a few of them and right click them and hit duplicate and then uh, edit the names to get them to where I want them to. Uh, and then if you open up one of your uh, vendor containers here, you're going to see that it's just a series of leveled lists. And you don't actually, if you don't want to duplicate any of these and you want to start from scratch, what I would do is just duplicate one and then just delete all these items on here. Just right click them, delete them out and just add whatever you you want in there um, but keep in mind for balance sake if you give them too much you, you can make the, the player it way too easy for them to get rich early with their workshop stuff although i think at this point we're all playing this game long enough that we're we we know how to get filthy rich and if you're modding that's even an easier thing so but if you want to if you want to show some semblance of care for the balance that uh, is in the game as far as level curving and everything then uh, you might want to follow one of these patterns and try not to give so many more items than bethesda did but again i'm not here to talk balance you guys can do whatever you want but this is how you would set up so you would set up all the leveled items you want for a the first basic shop type and then with this one you got to imagine it will be everything in this list plus everything in this list and then for the third tier shop it's going to be it's going to take all three lists combined so you don't want to take this stuff and add it to these automatically you have to keep in mind that that's going to happen in the background so you're going to think about your tier two shop as being this plus all of this. So if you were to just copy this over here and then start adding things, it's going to be it's going to be all that twice because it's going to be all of it that you copy pasted here plus all of it that this container is going to be. The way it ends up working is copies of these containers get created. And for depending on the shop type, those containers all get linked together to become the vendor's inventory. So um, just keep that in mind and you can set these up however you want. So once you've got your containers set up, you now need to set them in a form list. So we're gonna go ahead and go to our miscellaneous section here and go to form list. 
and uh, you can see there are our workshop vendors and if you were to open up any of these you can see they just have the three containers in them so we're going to do the same thing we're just going to create a new form list and we're going to just draw drag and drop our vendors in there they need to be in order from one two three if you have them out of order then it will cause the uh, wrong one to get assigned to the wrong level of shops so it's really important that they go in order one two three which is why uh, bethesda tends to name them like that because then when you drag and drop they will naturally get sorted in the correct order so make sure they're one, two, three in here. If for some reason you screwed that up, you can use these little arrows and move those around. And then you're gonna make sure you give this a unique ID. Now mine I've already created right here, as you can see, and they're in the correct order. So now we've got our form list. We've got our vendor containers. We know, we've thought about what faction we think we wanna use for dialogue. And uh, the last step that I'm only gonna show you briefly because I wanna show you that mistake that I made uh, is uh, what's going on with the actual furniture. And then we'll be able to set up our registration quest to set up our vendor to actually function. So um, what you'd want to do for these shops, and I've done tutorials on this sort of thing in the past, so many of you guys will already be familiar with this, but I'm sure a refresher wouldn't hurt. And I also want to show you guys the uh, the marker thing that I screwed up before. But you're basically going to find the store you want. Now, you don't have to use these models. Um, you can actually, if you've played with some settlements, you'll know that we don't always use these types of models, and you can use any animation, in fact. Now, I've probably covered that in tutorials in the past. If I haven't, and you guys would like me to, please, uh, about furniture items and custom, or not necessarily custom uh animations but changing which of the Bethesda animations you use feel free to post in the comments below and I will definitely add that to my list of things covered but I'm pretty sure I covered it now by now um so I like to just choose one that I like especially when I'm just quickly trying to get a shop up and running and I want to make sure that it's going to work pick one that I like the models for already and I start with that and I'll just rename it and hit okay so it creates a new version then you're going to set up a few things in here so the uh, first thing you'll want to set up is right over here this workshop rating vendor type that is what tells you which of the icons it uses so if you pull this down and you change it you can choose one of those six types and that will choose the icon that shows up so there's a nice generic one this general if none of those fits for yours the general is just a little shopping cart icon so that's a good one to use so make sure you're selected on this workshop rating type and actually i'm going to do it just so i don't have a dirty plug in here i'm going to go ahead and demo it on my own uh, furniture object here so let's open that up and we'll click on this workshop rating and if we go ahead and change that to general and then uh, we click off and when we click back on it should be yep it's collect on vendor i'm actually going to change it to weapon i just i like that better for combat items so there we go we got vendor type weapon so now in the in the game if i were to reassign them to it they would end up with the weapon icon when you highlight them in workshop mode so that's all that does right there. Um, you'll notice if when you start looking at these uh, setups the, between the three different shops that there's very little difference between the three different shops. The only thing that's actually different is the name, the model, um, the marker position, which is where I screwed up, the vendor income number, which is how many caps per day per settler uh, that the thing generates, and then this, these uh, workshop properties. So there's not a whole lot different between each of your different furniture nodes. But let me show you real quick where I screwed up and why our guy decided to work inside the counter. And you can see right here, if we zoom in, that our animation marker is actually dead set in the counter, or in the counter, and that was because um, instead of, the smart thing to do is to, for each of these, start with the next level and reconfigure it. What I ended up doing is I configured one of them and then I duplicated a couple times, and that was my, where my mistake went because I didn't know about this. Well, to fix this, you just click on this interact point, and then you just start tweaking this stuff until it looks correct. So you know, I could change this to 180, and then I just start messing with the Y until the blue man lines up kind of nicely so that he's not clipping in. So there, that's all it would have taken. And my level two shop would have worked correctly when we first showed it instead of being all wonky. Um, so that's where I screwed up. If you find the same problem, just adjust your marker by clicking on the interact point. Okay, so back to our first one. So after you found the one you like, you're gonna rename it. You're gonna give it a new ID so it's custom. Pick your rating vendor to choose your icon. And the majority, the real work, comes in your workshop object script. So we're gonna go in here. And uh, if you duplicate one of the other ones, you're gonna have, most likely, you're gonna have a vendor type and possibly a vendor level field already filled out. So you're gonna wanna go ahead and clear your vendor type field. Um, so if you had something in here, say for example, you had a, a one in the, oh, pardon me. Uh, you're gonna click on that, you're gonna hit clear value and that'll reset it to the default. And basically what we're doing is we're telling workshop framework, hey, I don't wanna use a vanilla vendor type, I wanna use a custom instead.
Then you're going to enter a unique ID, and this is unique across all mods installed. So make sure you come up with something very unique for yours that no one else could use. So for example, if I just chose combat item vendor, there's a chance somebody else could have come up with that as well, but it's very unlikely somebody else is gonna use my prefix KGWSFW combat item vendor. So this will be pretty well guaranteed to be unique across all mods that are installed for a player. So I just recommend using your prefix, maybe the same one you're using for all of your forms to make sure you've got a unique value here. Now you're gonna to wanna to copy this because you're gonna use this a bunch. So the other place that you would end up setting things is the vendor level. Now you could set this to zero um, by double clicking it and making sure it has a zero there. Zero is actually the level one vendor. That's the basic for, uh, because of the way computer stuff works with uh, array indexes or what it's called, numbers tend to start with zero. That's why that is. It's really confusing for people who aren't into computer science stuff, but unfortunately that's just the way a lot of things are set up. So zero is kind of level one, one is level two, two is level three. Deal with it, that's just the way it is. Okay, so we're gonna set that up for level zero for our level one shop, then for our level two, um, effectively we are going to go into the same thing in workshop object script and uh, vendor level this time will be one. And then we want our exact same string there. Same thing for level three. Once again, we're um, you know you can figure all the various properties, the name, the uh, the rating to match whatever you want it to be, and then once again we want the custom vendor ID to be identical here. So you're going to paste that uh, string in. Make sure your vendor level is two for your level three shop. All right. So now we're almost done. We have uh, one more thing, and then the last thing I can talk about here is uh, these construction records. I'll just show you mine, but they're basically just duplicating the vanilla ones. All right, so if we go back into our vendor registration quest here, you guys will have uh, a all of these custom vendor fields empty. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into our strings, and you're gonna add a new entry, and you're gonna paste your value. So basically you're telling it this is, you're telling, the uh, game, the workshop framework engine, what string it should look for on those workshop objects, on those furniture items to determine that it is indeed this vendor. And then these things are gonna tell it how to handle that. So we're gonna clear this out because I've already got that. We don't need to do it twice. Um, what you can see here that this allows multiple entries is this quest will support as many different vendors as you wanna register. Um, I believe that Workshop Framework only supports 128 different ones out of the box between all mods installed, but if people start releasing enough mods to where that became a limitation, I can adjust that. I can uh, I can expand the array limit as much as needed through uh, some clever array uh, overrides to get past the, the 128 limit. So if you guys find after toying with this, you find the in the community, it's pretty, you're starting to get it easy to get there, just reach out to me. I can gladly uh, extend that. Um, and if not me, by the time I'm ready to, if by the time you're watching this, I've already retired from the Fallout 4 community, I will have given control of Workshop Framework to another trusted party. So there will always be somebody out there managing this you can reach out to on our GitHub page. Uh, okay, so the next two things we're going to set up, the first one being optional, that's the faction. If you decided that there was a Workshop Vendor faction that you'd like to have the audio for, you can go ahead and fill this in. If you find that none of them work, then you can just leave this blank, you can clear that value. And uh, the default workshop framework system will give them the miscellaneous dialog. Or if you prefer to be explicit, you can select the miscellaneous from here. So you would just basically click add. Um, I like to just use the filter here. So I would type in something like workshop, find those vendor factions and uh, select the one you want there. And then when you click off, it will get filled in in that field there. So we'll remove that because we don't need it. Um, and then we're going to finally point to that form list we set up that has all of our different containers in it. So you can again hit add, search that guy up and select it there. Um, now the custom vendor keywords, this is something for coders. I put this in because it's something I like to have all the time is uh, this will make it so that when an NPC gets assigned to your vendor, they get attached to this corresponding keyword, makes it easy for doing things like get reference with keyword and things like that other functions so you can grab them and makes it easy to grab access to your vendors if you need them for various functionality. So that was just a coders little bonus that I threw in, but I think most of you guys aren't gonna need that. All right, so now let's talk Two more, I, I guess one, I was gonna say one more thing, let's go to the to the construction records, but I'm actually gonna hold off on that just a second. Let's talk about if you want to do two vendors um, or three vendors or whatever, more vendors in the same thing. So you'd basically follow all the steps I did so far, but you would continue to use your same registration quest. You do not need multiple. Um, and instead you're just gonna add a new entry 
and you're going to enter in your new thing. And yes, I know I already showed you guys this technically. I just because I, I pasted it in like this. Um, but the reason I'm saying this again and reiterating because there's a point in there where things could go awry um, that I want you guys to be aware of. So we'll say we'll just gonna name this O2. This is just we'll claim this is a different combat item vendor. Um, actually, that's confusing because of the level. So we'll call this guy. Um, we'll call him a chem vendor. Sure. Uh, and then uh, we would, of course, set up our list, and we'll pretend that I have. We'll pretend that this legendary mod rule is our chem vendor list. Um, now, here's where it could get weird. Let's say you had cleared the value on your first one. Let's say you had set up your vendor like this, and then you decided, you know what, my chem vendor, I want to have the clinic documents. I want him to be able to go ahead and heal people. So let's go ahead and set that up. Um, well, one thing to keep in mind here is that you see this number right here. So it's zero here, zero here, zero here. That's the index. And those are going to match up perfectly. So what's going to happen if you have this only one filled in, that is going to be tied to custom vendor zero, our combat item, which is not what we want. So if you get into that situation, um, what you can actually do is you can have a what's called a none entry or a null entry for uh, the coders out there. So you can basically leave it like that. So now we have none that matches our vendor combat item. And that's basically saying use the miscellaneous vendor. So again, that might be useful to just be explicit with it. Just put in the vendor faction miscellaneous. But if you didn't want to, um, you could just select none there by leaving a blank entry. Just make sure that the numbers of each of these indexes match with the correct vendor string number. As long as all those three are matched across all of the different vendors you're registering, you'll be good to go. Okay, so now we've got those set up. And then the last thing, is your actual records for construction. So what I find the easiest way to set this up, and this is what I wanted to show is just a shortcut. Um, I've already done tutorials on how to set these up. They're pretty straightforward. Um, but what I like to do is I right click on the thing I'm emulating. So in this case, I was emulating the workshop store things and I go to use info and you can see there's a COBJ record and that is a constructible object record. So we can double click on that and that will bring up the vanilla version. And now we can just change the ID to be our own and now we've got the cost all set up. We've got the where it shows up in the workshop menus set up. And we've got the perk requirements all set up. So basically, all we have to do then is change this up here and select our item from the created object list. Hit OK, and we're done. And then we would repeat that for armor counter 2. And you would want to do it for each of the different types because the costs do go up in the vanilla game. If your goal is to stay balanced and try and follow that, you'll see that each one has a slightly higher cost. And uh, then at level 3, it's even got a higher perk requirement. So... Uh, this will allow you to uh, emulate that real quickly. You can basically just change this name and change that created object. Um, because as far as I know, all of the different vendor types cost the same amount, but I might be wrong on that. But again, it's still way easier than you try to balance it all out. And it saves you a lot of trouble of setting up that construction record, which can normally take a while to do from scratch. All right, guys, hopefully that uh, is enough to get you rolling. Uh, again, I will include the raw script, the source file for this script below in the uh, Bethesda Mod School Rele uh, resources, which is available. I'll have an update. You can click on a link down in the description and go download that. And that has a lot of other resources. And if you haven't been following along, I recently did an update to that outside of tutorials that fixed the Mixamo animations. So talking about custom anim animations for your shop type, some of those Mixamo animations might be useful. There are over 2000 animations included with that toolkit that you guys are free to use. And most of them um, uh, should work well in the game. They don't all look beautiful. Uh, some of them are a little wonky, and but uh, there's quite a few of them that do look decent. Um, and we fixed recently fixed up an issue with their heads, um, thanks to Sebo, who uh, put that toolkit together. He also found the fix for uh, some wonky head animations that were occurring. So if you had used those in the past, thought they were a little weird, they uh, might work a lot better now. So go grab the latest version of the uh, Bethesda Mod School Resources Mod. All right, guys, take care, and hopefully I will have another one of these for you next week. Otherwise, I'll see you as soon as I can.